As we saw last time, there are sequences of probability measures that have no weakly convergent subsequences. Here's a simple example, the point mass at n. That sequence has no weakly convergent subsequences because if k is any compact subset of the real line, the measure delta n of k is zero for all sufficiently large n. That means that the sequence is not tight, and moreover, if I choose any subsequence, I will still have this property holding, and so there is no tight subsequence. But since any weakly convergent sequence is tight, it follows that there are no weakly convergent subsequences. As it happens, this tightness constraint is the one and only obstruction to the existence of weakly convergent subsequences. And that's our compactness result, the Prokhorov compactness theorem. If S is any separable metric space, and mu n is a sequence of Borel probability measures on S, then there is always a vaguely convergent subsequence. As we saw last time, vaguely convergent subsequences are weakly convergent if and only if they are tight. And therefore, as a corollary, if mu n is a tight sequence of Borel probability measures on this separable metric space, then there does exist a weakly convergent subsequence whose limit mu is therefore a probability measure. We proved last time that a vaguely convergent subsequence that is tight is weakly convergent and its limit is a probability measure. Now we are not going to prove Prokhorov's theorem in this level of generality. The proof would take up several lectures because we would have to develop some of the functional analytic tools that it relies on. This is the same reason that we skipped the proof of the radon nicodem theorem. And in fact, it's the same tools that are involved the Ries representation theorem. We are going to prove this theorem in the case where we'll use it most when S is the real line. In that case, it goes under the name Helly's selection theorem. So here is a proof of Helly's selection theorem. We're going to work exclusively with the distribution functions of our measures. And it's important to realize that since the distribution functions are right continuous non-decreasing functions, they are determined by their values on any dense subset of the real line, in particular on the rationals, which are a countable dense subset. The fact that there exists a countable dense subset, which is comparable to the requirement that the metric space in general be separable, is necessary for this theorem to be true. Let's pick our favorite enumeration of this countable dense subset. So we list the rational numbers in some order. And now let's consider the distribution functions of our measures. Let Fn be the CDF of mu n. We're now going to go through a Cantor diagonal type argument to construct a subsequential limit of the functions Fn on the rationals. Let's start with the first rational. The sequence fn of that fixed rational numbers is a sequence of real numbers in the unit interval. The unit interval is compact, and therefore there exists a convergent subsequence of this sequence. So let's label those indices as m1 of k. Great. Now let's look at the second rational number, and let's look at f m1 of k, so the sequence of indices for the first subsequence already restricting there, but with Q2. Again, this is a sequence of numbers in the unit interval, which is compact. It therefore has a convergent subsequence, which we will call Fm2. So these converge at Q2, but by the way we've constructed things, the sequence of indices M2 is contained in the sequence of indices M1, and that means that since every subsequence of a convergent sequence converges to the same limit, we also have that at Q1, this sequence of functions converges. And now we proceed in this fashion going down the list for each j constructing a sequence of indices mj, which is a subset of the indices mj minus 1, such that for all rational numbers qj, fmj of k converges as k goes to infinity to some number. 
And let's call that number, which depends on the rational input, qj, which is some number in the unit interval. Now from this sequence of sequences of functions, we want to pick a single sequence which converges at all of the points qj, and the way we do that is selecting the diagonal set of indices, mk of k. Let's let that be nk. And the claim is that that converges to g on all rational numbers. This is the standard Cantor diagonal argument that we encountered once before, and the reason that it holds true is because the sequence of diagonal indices m, k of k, if we take the tail of them starting at j, that is a subsequence of the index sequence m, j of k. And since this sequence with index j converges on qj, that means that with this subsequence of indices will also converge on qj. But that's true for every j. And so we do indeed have that this single sequence f and k converges pointwise to this limit function g on q. Now we'd like to establish that this g is the distribution function of a measure, and then we'll be nearly done. In order to prove that, we need it to be right continuous and non-decreasing. But actually, we need more than that. We need it to be defined on the whole real line. Right now, it's just defined on the rationals. So what we're going to do is extend it to the whole real line, essentially by insisting on it being non-decreasing. And the way we do that is to define an extension f at x to be, for every real number x, the infimum of g on those rational points that are bigger than x. If you've seen the Dedekind cut construction of the real line, this should look familiar. Now we're going to prove that this function is non-decreasing and right continuous, and that fnk converges pointwise to it at the continuity points of f. So first, to see that it's non-decreasing, if x and y are two real numbers with x less than y, and if q is a rational number bigger than y, which is bigger than x, it follows that q is bigger than x, and that means that the set of numbers, g of q, where q is a rational bigger than y, is contained in the set of numbers g of q, where q is a rational number bigger than x. Now f at y is defined to be the infimum of this set here. And f at x is defined to be the infimum of this set here. And since this is contained in this, its infimum is bigger than or equal to the infimum of this larger set. And that shows us that when x is less than y, f at y is bigger than or equal to f at x, which shows that f is a non-decreasing function. We also want to see that it's right continuous. Well, we've seen that f is non-decreasing, and so that means that if xn is a decreasing sequence, then so is f at xn. And therefore, the limit of f at xn, which we know exists because f at xn is always greater than or equal to zero, is the same thing as the infimum since f is a non-decreasing function. Now by the definition, that's the infimum over n of the infimum of the numbers g of q, where q is a rational number bigger than xn. So this is a double infimum, and that means it's just the infimum over all of these q's and all of these n's, which is the same as saying that it's the infimum of all the numbers g of q, where q is a rational number that is bigger than some xn for some n. Now, if our sequence xn decreases to a number x, it then follows from the definition of infimum that this is equal to the infimum of the numbers g of q over all rational numbers q bigger than x, the infimum of the xn's. And that is the definition of fx, which shows that indeed the function f that we defined is right continuous. 
Now, we need to be careful. This f need not be a distribution function. As we've seen in examples, a limit of CDFs may not tend to zero at minus infinity, but we now have seen that this function is a bounded function, which is non-negative, is non-decreasing and right continuous, and therefore if I translate it down by its limit as x goes to minus infinity, so that it does go to zero there, it will be the CDF of a Borel measure on the real line, not necessarily a probability measure, of course. In order to prove that we actually have vague convergence, as you'll prove on your homework, that's equivalent to showing that fnk on the interval from a up to b converges to f on the interval from a up to b for all endpoints a and b that are continuity points of f. That's what we need to prove now, and in fact we will be able to prove the nominally stronger statement that for all points x, fn of x converges to f at x, provided that f is continuous at x. So fix a continuity point x of f, Again, we're going to use the density of the rationals in the reals here, and we'll fix some sequence qj of rational numbers that increase to x, and a different sequence of rational numbers that decrease to x. That is, x is nested in between qj and rj for every j, and those close in on x. Now, since all of the functions fn are non-decreasing functions, it follows that fnk of qj is less than or equal to fnk of x is less than or equal to fnk of rj for all j and all k. Now we're going to take limits. As k goes to infinity, by construction, this converges to g of qj. Now that limit, which we can construe as a lim inf, is by this inequality here, less than or equal to the lim inf of fnk of x, which is of course less than or equal to the lim sup of that same sequence, and that will be less than or equal to the lim sup of fnk of rj by this inequality, but that lim sup is a genuine limit because, again, by construction, that limit is equal to g of rj. Now remember, our function f was defined to be the infimum of all the values g of q, where q is a rational number bigger than x. It's easy to check, because f is a non-decreasing function, that if x is actually a rational number, this infimum is achieved by taking q equal to x. And so therefore, because qj is rational, g of qj is equal to f at qj, and g of rj is equal to f at rj. So what we see is that for any x, and for any rational numbers, q less than x and r greater than x, f at q is less than or equal to this lim inf, and f at r is greater than or equal to this lim sup. Now let's use the fact that f is continuous from the left down to the right at the point x. If we let qj tend to x and rj tend to x from above and below, by the squeeze theorem from this chain of inequalities, we get that f at x, which is the limit of f of qj and the limit of f of rj, is a lower bound and an upper bound for each of these terms. That forces them to both be equal to f at x, which means that the limit of fnk of x is equal to f at x, as we hoped to prove. And that concludes our proof of Halley's selection theorem, the one-dimensional version of the Prokhorov compactness theorem. It's possible to use very similar ideas to prove the Prokhorov compactness theorem for probability measures on Rd by taking the d-dimensional equivalent of cumulative distribution functions in this proof. But we'll satisfy ourselves with this one-dimensional version, although we will use the more general version on separable metric spaces in later theorems in this course. This result is going to play an important role in soon coming lectures on an analytical tool that we use to deal with weak convergence, the characteristic function.